Hello everybody in the Credo community. My name is Scott Pingle and I am a musician who plays the bass. I'm so happy to have been asked to do this video for the Whatever Is series, and my hope is that it'll be as beneficial for you as it has already been for me in the process of making it. Since I'm new to Credo, please allow me a moment to introduce myself. As I mentioned, I'm a musician who plays the bass, and this is something I have done in many different forms and genres throughout my career, from playing electric bass in funk rock and fusion bands, to the upright double bass in jazz groups, classical chamber groups and orchestras, to even playing electric upright bass with a certain well-known heavy metal band. However, most of my work at this point has been serving as the principal bass of the San Francisco Symphony and teaching at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. What I love most about playing the bass, in any genre, is its primary role in providing the sonic foundation upon which other musicians may thrive in their respective roles, and the cumulative effect we achieve when we are all working together toward a beautiful and meaningful end. Truly, it is a blessing to get to play music and to work with others traversing their path, both in the art form and in life. For this Whatever Is video, I have chosen a short passage of scripture that has profound depth in what it reveals about God's nature and His purpose in creation. I find that it also has powerful implications regarding our relationship with Him, with each other, and our work as musicians. My scripture passage is from Psalm 104, verse 31, which states, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in His works. Okay, take a moment and try to recall one of the most moving musical performances you've ever experienced. It probably won't be too difficult to do because memories of such things tend to remain quite vividly within us. Perhaps it was some superb performance of a work of overwhelming majesty and scale involving a huge orchestra and a towering pipe organ and a massive chorus in some immense concert hall completely full of people. Or perhaps it was a very special intimate concert in a small humble space involving only a few. But regardless of the scale, how might you describe that experience? You might use words such as powerful, delightful, amazing, magnificent, or beautiful. And in so doing, you'd be endeavoring to describe its glory. Yet there's something else that always seems to show up whenever we experience that which is glorious, and that is joy. But joy is something more than just happiness, though that is certainly part of it. Rather, it is something that encompasses our sense of meaning and value and peace and satisfaction. And why is that? Why does the experience of the beautiful and glorious carry with it such joy and satisfaction? As we will see from the scripture passage, it is because it is a reflection of our Creator and His purpose in His creation. The first half of our scripture states, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. But what might the glory of the Lord be like? The name for God used in the scripture passage is an enlightening place to start. In most English translations, the word Lord is written in all capital letters to distinguish it from all the other names for God in the Bible. It serves to represent Yahweh, which is the very special name God revealed about himself to Moses, and it means, I am that I am. What God tells us about himself with his name is that he is the self-sufficient, self-existent, non-contingent being who is infinitely greater than all things. It means that his glory, power, and honor exceed that of the entire universe and all that is in it. And yet, by sharing his name, he also shows that he would have us know him personally. Now, there was a time in my life when I tried to believe that God didn't exist, that the whole idea was perhaps some kind of a fairy tale or at least something we couldn't really know. Yet a number of things kept nagging at me. And a big one was that I simply could not muster enough faith to believe that no one plus nothing could equal everything. But God brought me to faith in Him and through His grace, spirit, and word, I began to see more and more how all of creation, from the miracle of our DNA to the smile of a child, to the beautiful music we play, to the expanse of the universe, all of it declares the glory of God and proclaims the work of His hands. And this is because God is the author of all potentiality, actuality, substance, and life. He is the person who created personality, the intellect who created intelligence, the agent who created agency, and the creator who created creativity. He is the lover who is love and the judge who is justice, and his holiness and grace are the radiant consuming truth of all things. 
He is the root of relationship because He is relational in His own essence. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons of equal yet distinct roles, eternally existing in the perfect relationship of love, faithfulness, goodness, joy, peace, and satisfaction. Indeed, He is the spring of living waters from which these blessings flow, and He is the means by which we know that in their corruption or their absence, things are not right. Therefore, all the glory and attendant joy that we experience in our lives is a reverberation of His originating creative word. And because His glory is the greatest, it is also the deepest joy of human souls. And this brings us to the second part of our scripture passage, which is, may the Lord rejoice in his works. So why would God, who is self-existent and has the perfect relationship within his own essence and has no need of anything, determine to create beings such as ourselves? And what does it tell us about what might bring him to rejoice in his works? I love what the eminent 18th century theologian, author, and preacher Jonathan Edwards has to say about this, which of course is a lot. Edwards concludes that the invincible end for which God created the world is first, that the glory of God might be magnified in the universe, and second, that Christ's ransomed people from all times and all nations would rejoice in God above all things. This means that God, the great I Am, determined to give of himself and magnify his glory by creating the universe and all that is in it, not because he needed anything, but for the infinite and eternal love and joy of his creation. Therefore, what brings him to rejoice in his works is this, when we reflect his glory back onto himself by our love and joy in him. As musicians, this can inspire us to do all that we do for the glory of God, and in so doing, for the good of all, because God is our good. When faced with setbacks and disappointment, this can help inspire us to become better rather than bitter, and be grateful for the gift of making music, for ourselves, for others, and most of all, for our Creator. Before we end, I want to return to the memorable musical performance that we envisioned earlier. This time, imagine the last glorious notes of that performance ringing out into the space. But instead of hearing any applause or shouts of joy, there's nothing but silence and indifference. Everyone simply just gets up and leaves as if nothing happened, and never so much as mentions it to anyone. Wouldn't that seem odd and unfulfilling? Of course it would. This is because our joy is only fulfilled by rejoicing and reflecting glory back onto its source. I think that is what the psalmist means when he writes, may the glory of God endure forever and may the Lord rejoice in his works. By these words, he is stating not only the reality about God, his glory will in fact endure forever and he will rejoice in his works as he determines. But I believe the psalmist is also fulfilling the very desire and joy of his own heart through rejoicing. Isn't that what we should do with our own lives? One of the greatest musicians in history, J.S. Bach, has blessed countless people around the world with experiences of glory, joy, and rejoicing. But he didn't do it merely for himself, but rather sought to give of himself for the glory of God and for the good of others. He made it a point to convey this by writing on all of his manuscripts, the initials SDG, which stands for Soli Deo Gloria, and means to the glory of God alone. I hope this may serve as a source of encouragement and inspiration for you to seek after God and rejoice in knowing that the deepest joy of your soul is in Him. My name is Scott Pingle. Thanks for watching, and Soli Deo Gloria.